yeast are the new trees, but trees are still trees. And how can we use our existing biology toolkit to improve the way that trees are grown? Hey, Ram. Hey, Carl. What's up? Hey, I'm super excited because we're about to interview Shara Tiku of C16 Bioscientist. Yes, I'm very excited about her too. I'm definitely a fangirl. She's just so impressive across the board. Great leader, CEO. Interestingly, she doesn't have a biotech background. Spoiler alert for the interview, but she is just by all means very intelligent and comes at biotech very thoughtfully and very deliberately. And just for our audience to hear her story and what they're doing, it's going to be opening people's minds. I'm also a, a huge fan of Shara's and have been telling people about C16 for as long as I've, I've known them. We met her early on before the pandemic. The company was still very young, but what I was very impressed by was the fact that they were moving their company from Boston to New York City and that was something that we had not seen before. Typically, people start companies in New York and move them to Boston or San Francisco. But we're starting to see this wave of new companies that are moving to New York. And since they work in the consumer biotech space, it's our theory. You want to be in New York City if you're going to build a consumer biotech brand. This isn't to discount any of the other biotech hubs, but it is a really nice place to be building that kind of company. So I'm excited for the interview as well. So we're super excited to have you, Shara. We see you as a shining example of New York biotech. So for people who don't know anything about C16 Biosciences, can you tell us about your company and, and where are you today? Yes, absolutely. C16 Biosciences is decarbonizing consumer products through next generation ingredients. And specifically, we're focused on next generation oils and fats. We've actually just announced our consumer facing solutions platform, which is called Palmless. And Palmless is, as you might have guessed, an alternative to palm oil. Why do we care about palm oil? Palm oil is in 50% of products on supermarket shelves. It wow. is found in everything from soap and shampoo to lipstick to the foods that we eat like Nutella or Oreos. Um, and sometimes it's even used as cooking oil or as an input for biodiesel. So it's truly ubiquitous. It's grown tremendously over the last 60 years. And many people think it's grown because it's just really cheap, which is certainly true for some applications. But in fact, it's the most popular vegetable oil in the world because it's just really good at what it does. It is what helps the color stay on your lipstick. It is what makes the soap or the body wash in your shower foam and cleanse. It's what makes Nutella spread just that perfect spreadable, spoonable nature. But the problem with palm oil is the way that it's produced. And really, it comes down to the concept of industrial agriculture that's focused on better, cheaper, faster, and not taking into account cost, such as the use of our land, biodiversity, and climate impact. And so what C16 does is reimagining that. We're reimagining our relationship with nature and looking to transition from a world in which our relationship with nature is highly extractive, as we see in industrial agriculture for oils and fats today, to a future where we have a relationship that's symbiotic with nature. And we use nature in a more powerful way to make better performing and more sustainable ingredients and products. I think it's great. Like I know for me, the palm oil thing struck a few years ago, we were in Costa Rica. We were taking the bus from San Jose to Panama, which we used to do a lot as a kid. And just seeing mile after mile after mile of these palm trees and going, wow, what the hell happened here? I don't know how long that has been planted there, but I was really struck by this idea that these trees were replacing the, the jungle. I also remember seeing like this picture of the last orangutan in Borneo or something like that. And you have a story that you talk about going to Singapore and just like how dirty the air was. Could you tell that story? Because it's important to put this into context for people. Yes. So in my past life, I, I did not work in biotech. I worked on Wall Street, but that's where I learned about palm oil for the first time. So about 10 years ago, I was working on Wall Street. I was working for Goldman Sachs. 
and I covered some of our accounts in Asia. And I was taking a trip to Asia to meet with some of our clients in the region. And Goldman sent me over with a stack of N95 masks. This was 2013. I did not know what an N95 mask was, nor did I know why I was wearing it. So I land in Singapore and there's this thick haze. I have a picture of myself up at Marina Bay Sands, the big hotel there, the this sort of big hotel with a big ship on it. And the air is just black. And it's because the air quality index in Singapore, when I landed, was over 400. And anything over 300 is considered highly toxic. Just to put that in context, we live in New York. We're all calling in from New York City. Big city, you'd think we'd be used to pollution and bad air quality. The air quality index in New York this morning was 44. 44 versus 400. So I'm in Singapore. You can feel this pollution in the air. They've canceled schools. They've asked pregnant women not to walk outside. And I asked my colleagues what's going on. And they said, oh, our neighbors are are burning forest for palm oil production. By the way, this happens every year. So I was shocked by this. It was my real introduction to, to palm oil. And I think, honestly, it was the first time I had seen climate change in real life. And I'm not sure that totally hit me until a few years later. It's kind of hard to remember, but 10 years ago, we weren't really talking about climate change. We didn't have the IPCC report warning us about how urgent this was, but it was the first time I had seen it. And it's interesting, Carl, that you mentioned Costa Rica, because the way that this came about and into our founding story was a few years later, I met my co-founder, Harry, an almost identical story to you in Costa Rica, where he went to go see the rainforest and it was gone. There was no rainforest. It was just this monoculture plantation of oil palms. It was about three or four years later and I had this crazy deja vu and we started looking into it and realized how ubiquitous palm oil was. And also there was this clear demand statement to have a better alternative. There were hundreds of companies and in fact, nine countries, which had called out the palm oil problem, but they'd been unable to do anything because there was no viable alternative because agriculture was failing to solve the problem. So we started asking the question, what if biology could solve this problem? What would that look like? What's amazing about this origin story and thinking about the countries that have been impacted. But why don't you talk about what does a technology look like? How does biology solve this palm oil problem? Great. So I said this lofty thing about reimagining our relationship with nature. So that sounds beautiful, but what does it mean? I've talked about palm oil, which is the most popular vegetable oil, but really we're focused on the broader oils and fats landscape. So what we try to do is reimagine the way that we make these oils and fats. Today, we find, we use, we make oils and fats from either animal sources, animal fats, or plant sources, these vegetable oils and oil seeds, which include palm oil, coconut oil, canola or rapeseed oil, soybean oil, and so forth. And what our technology at C16 does is say, let's stop relying on the plant and animal kingdom and let's shift to the fungal kingdom. So let's look to the microorganisms rather than these organisms that we've been working with. So instead of using animals or plants in this highly extractive way, we use microorganisms. And specifically, we use a yeast, which has in fact evolved for centuries to become really good at making oil. So nature did a lot of the work for us, which is one of the really exciting things about this field, as we start to be able to identify new microorganisms, new strains of yeast, and develop tools for harnessing them, it opens up a lot of things that weren't previously possible. And I think our technology is one example of that. So we found this yeast, and essentially from here, we combine ages old technology called fermentation, which we've used for centuries to make medicine like insulin and food products and also cosmetic products like hyaluronic acid is is largely made from fermentation but we have improved our ability to use it as a technology we've improved the precision of it by using some of the latest most developed most innovative tools in biotechnology such as the ability to sequence the genome read make edits to the genome evolve the strain and do engineering to the process to improve the product that we make 
how large we can scale that process and how cheaply we can scale that process over time. That's awesome. I didn't realize you guys are using yeast. We asked on Twitter, and you may have seen this a couple of weeks ago, where we were like, what's the economic value of yeast and E. coli, since those are the two workhorses of biotech? And Iram uncovered a stat that said yeast alone is a $900 billion industry. It's like wow. almost 3% of the U.S. economy when you take into consideration, yes, personal care, brewing, baking, and then all the other products that are produced with yeast. That's today? That was in 2018. Wow. It's about to explode. I'm sure you're thinking that, Shara, <laughs> like all the possibilities. I love that stat. I'm going to take that. Yeah, <laughs> there, credit you, of course. The, it comes from a book called The Rise of Yeast. We'll find it and we'll send it to you. Someone commented, do we control the yeast or does the yeast control <laughs> us? That's a question that we ask a lot when it comes to microbiome. We have a meme wall in our lab and it's just covered with yeast memes. That question of do we control the yeast or does the yeast control us shows up all over our meme wall. So come see it. I can't wait. So you guys have come up with this technology that harnesses yeast. You're fermenting palm oil. And uh, are you guys doing the manufacturing yourselves? What does that look like? Yeah, so you just led with a very relevant stat, which is that the yeast is currently a $900 billion economy. So there are a lot of people and capabilities and assets and infrastructure already dedicated to fermentation of yeast. That is a good thing. Part of what we're doing is highly innovative. We're the first people in the world to do it, which is a great thing. But we also don't want to be the first people in the world to do everything. We want to find ways where we can plug into existing infrastructure, existing supply chains, because that will help us go faster. And we have a real urgency because we're solving a climate change problem, because we're focused on decarbonization and we're short on time. So we have urgency because we're problem solvers and we want to move fast, but we have urgency because the problem demands it. So being able to work with existing infrastructure is really, really valuable. We have our lab, our headquarters here in New York City. We've got a 20,000 square foot lab in the middle of Manhattan, which is very cool. But we do not have thousand liter tanks or tens of thousand gallon tanks in the middle of Manhattan. That wouldn't really make sense. We work with partners, manufacturing partners that already have these tanks. So as you painted a picture Beer or ethanol are two examples of largely scaled fermentation industries today. And we work with manufacturers who have assets like that. They have big steel tanks and we use them as a total manufacturing model. And it allows us to move really quickly and it allows us to focus on the things that we need to innovate around. It allows us to focus on the R&D and also the brand and go to market, which is a really, really important and powerful part of what we do and, and outsource building of a plant capital expenditures of a plant and all these things, which don't necessarily add value to our innovation, we get to let somebody else do that and partner with them. I look at the deforestation of the rainforest, which is largely done to grow protein and palm oil. They're growing cows and soybeans. Yes. And, and my thinking, it's always, can't we just put a bunch of breweries down there, teach these people how to brew? Yes, it's a different kind of labor requirement versus chopping down trees and plowing fields. However, it could solve the problem. So what's your distributed model when it comes to international? This is still in our vision for the future for the entire industry and for us, but I have the same vision for the future. In the past, we've had these mega factories be the solution. You get something to this massive scale, you make it all there, and then you send it around the world. We've seen globalization rapidly expand. Countries have specialized and then they've exported and imported things accordingly. But as we look around the past couple of years from a macro perspective, allow me to sort of think about the macro economy for a second, we're starting to see things change. And with oils and fats, for example, over 80% of soybean oil comes from the region around Ukraine. And as we had Russia's invasion of Ukraine and war breakout, that supply has vanished overnight. Just a few months later, in, in May of this year, Indonesia, who exports 60% of global palm oil, decided overnight they were going to stop exporting palm oil and just keep it for themselves. 
they've reversed that, but they've also since made big climate commitments, which involve taking the palm oil that they produce today, which is largely used in food across the world, and shifting that to biodiesel production inside the economy to meet some of their net zero emissions goals. So as we think about what the future might look like, I actually think it's really powerful for countries or regions to be able to rely on themselves to make the products that they need. Biology and fermentation in particular really unlock that because the problem with palm oil is that it can only grow in certain parts of the world. It can only grow right around the equator, which is why people start burning down that forest and why it only comes from certain countries. But fermentation is limitless. It can happen anywhere in the world. And so absolutely, you can start to think about having a biomanufacturing facility for making oils and fats in North America that leverages feedstock from North America and supplies North American customers, and one in Southeast Asia that uses those feedstock that's, that stays in that part of the economy and contributes to the GDP there and supplies those customers and those consumers as well. And we're not there yet. I want to be clear. As an industry, we're not there, but I believe that's where we're going. I believe it's a really powerful vision for what the future of this industry might look like. One of the things that COVID did was it shined a light on the fragility of supply chains. And so as a result of that, many companies, many countries realized, hey, why are we so dependent on these supply chains? What can we do to localize them? What you're saying makes a lot of sense. And I'm totally in agreement because I think that there is this decoupling of supply chains that is happening that people might not realize because people want that security internally in their countries, but then it doesn't have to just be in country. It could also be regional. From a climate change perspective, then you're not shipping, for example, liquids. Why are you shipping liquids around the world? That makes no sense. But I would also imagine that potentially from, from a manufacturing point of view, you can also localize. You can be next to p and in Cincinnati, next to Cargill down somewhere in the South, wherever their headquarters is. And like you, what you're talking about allows you to really be local to whoever you're manufacturing for. We often talk about performance and sustainability and of course cost as the three levers that matter to buyers of these bio-based products. But You've just hit on something that has been subtle, which has come to light, but from our perspective has always been a major unlock. For a buyer of a palm oil alternative, whether that's a, an agribusiness company like Cargill or whether it's a consumer products company like Procter & Gamble, being able to have predictability of the quantity, the cost, and of course the quality of their inputs critical. And they don't have that today. So being able to have a facility of a key ingredients manufacturer co-located to their site where they know how much the cost of that and the quality of that is something that does not exist and would be a really big unlock for a lot of components that go into our consumer products. We call ourselves a consumer biotechnology company because we're focused on solving problems that impact consumers. So that's what I know. And that's what I can talk about really broadly. But if you think about everything from inputs for plastics to palm oil and oils and fats to proteins, there's so much that this industry can unlock from that secure and stable and predictable supply chain. Shah, you were mentioning that different countries could have different feedstocks. I'm curious, what feedstock are you guys using? Well, so this is a big advance in the industry and reflected by our technology. So when you look back maybe 10 years ago, you really only had one or two microorganisms that could be used as factories. And they could be particular. So they might only be able to eat sucrose, cane sugar. They might only be able to grow in really tight temperature conditions. And I was alluding to this earlier, but one of the really exciting things about the future of biotechnology is we find new microorganisms every day. We're able to sequence their genomes. We're able to develop new tools for growing them. That is a capability set that has never existed in humanity. And so there's a tendency to look back and say, well, we tried this thing and it didn't work. And so it won't work again, but that's completely ignoring the fact of 
this unlocked potential that's coming as the field advances. Our company and our technology is one example of that. I alluded to the idea of being able to grow our product in different countries with different feedstocks. Somebody well-studied in the industry might say, well, that doesn't make sense because your organism probably has to grow in a certain type of sugar. What we've demonstrated with our technology is that some of these new microorganisms, in fact, can do that. So our yeast can grow on every primary carbon source. So we've demonstrated its ability to grow on glucose, sucrose, glycerol, arabinose. We've, we've demonstrated its ability to grow on non-pure feedstocks as well, opening up the potential to really innovate around upcycled or waste stream feedstocks. And again, there's still innovation that needs to happen, but that points to a really promising set of options in the future that this industry is just really starting to stumble on. And I think we're really just hitting the height of the S curve for our industry as we start to unlock these new tools. You're checking off a lot of boxes, you know, with being sustainable, looking at waste feedstock, which is huge. One of the companies that we speak with is Polybion. I'm not sure if you know of them, but mm -hmm. that's their goal to be 100% sustainable. But as Carl mentioned, I went to your event. I heard of your entry into the personal care space and that yeah. Palmas product. Why did you choose it? And please talk about it. Yeah. We've spent most of the time today talking so far about the problem and about the technology. Technology is super important. Technology is foundational. If you don't have the technology to solve the right problem and to solve a real problem that exists, you don't have a business full stop. However, it takes more than that. Even what we're talking about today is something that the average consumer, at least in America, does not think about and, and probably doesn't even know is an option at this point or an opportunity. We often have to take a step back and just remember that we eat, sleep and breathe this, but the average consumer probably doesn't even know about it. So we think that brand and communication and storytelling and simplicity there are critical for bringing these solutions to the forefront. Impossible Foods was one of really the first companies to be able to do this. And they were a company that inspired my co-founders and I a lot. And that simple branding of Impossible Burger on the menu in Momofuku Nishi here in New York when they rolled out was innovative and bold, but powerful for driving that consumer pull through. Because in this space, you have to sort of work on supply and demand. You have to work on the big players on the supply chain, the big Goliaths and getting them to change, but also consumers. To, to drive that change as well. And they do, and they want to, and they're willing, but they have to know what the options are. So we recently launched Palmless, which is our consumer facing brand solutions platform. And it's essentially our Intel inside. It is the brand portfolio under which we will release a series of products because our technology is essentially a platform for making multiple products. The first product is an alternative to palm oil, which is in and of itself a platform product. And we'll start to roll out multiple ingredients solving problems in the personal care and beauty space, in the home care space, and in the food applications space under that Palmless brand. And Palmless is a way for us to be loud and clear about who we are, what we do, and why you care. And it will go on pack with our customers, like Intel Inside, to communicate to their consumers really clearly what they're doing, both from an innovation standpoint, but also from that sustainability standpoint. It's just really important for us to be clear in building a brand that was driving home the message because consumers are so overwhelmed with information. And so that's what Palmless is. And you'll see first Palmless products on shelves in early 2023, which we're very excited about. I just want to be clear, your Palmless is going to be both your direct-to-consumer brand, but then also, let's say I'm PNG and I'm using one of your products, it would also be branded as Palmless Inside, as it were. Palmless is going to be anything that touches consumers. That's right. So what specific products? Can you share that? We're starting in skincare. So the beauty and personal care industry is about a $500 billion market today, which is hilarious because the number of people who have told me that they think it's sweet that we're starting in a niche industry 
like the beauty industry. And I, I have to inquire as to when a $500 billion market became a niche market, but it's a massive market. It's a really interesting market. And we have found customers that love our ingredient across the personal care industry because it hits that intersection of innovation and sustainability. And brands and product manufacturers in the personal care space are so focused on those two axes, innovation and, and values of doing the right thing around sustainability. So within personal care, skincare is where we're starting. Um, we found some really exciting customers to work with there. The product that we're launching is an oil. So oil has a lot of benefits on the skin for hydration, but also for delivering other ingredients and its role in complex formulations for all the things that you want your skincare products to do. But we are working in body care and hair care and hopefully in cosmetics and color cosmetics as well. You're talking to these companies, they're going to put palmless inside the products. How do you make the case to them to switch over to using palms besides the sustainability? That's like a slam dunk. We know that that's great. But in terms of the, the financial ROI, is it cheaper to produce palmless than using palm oil in the bad traditional way? It's not cheaper. It's better. It's a, it's a great product. We just announced palmless earlier this month, a few weeks ago, we launched on CNBC and that was really our announcement of our entry into the commercialization stage. And also our announcement that we're ready to talk about what we're doing since then we've been stealthy. We weren't in stealth mode, but we were quiet. We were heads down focused on the R and D on the product, on the safety of the product, on our intellectual property strategy making sure everything was right and ready to take to market before we really started talking about it. Yet, despite that, our first customers found us. That says two things. One is there's clear demand for this solution, so much so that these customers are scouring the internet looking for a solution and, and stumble upon us and reach out to us even though our website at the time was very minimal, we didn't really say much about what we did, but we spoke enough about the problem for them to reach out. And then the second thing is, you know, the good thing about your first customers finding you are they're the leaders, they're the innovators. So these are customers who are really pushing boundaries on innovation and on sustainability on both of them. And so they're really willing partners to be able to take your product and test it and try it. And they also have a very high standard. So that's been really good for us. And I think the way that this has really come about has been our first customers have found us. They have been hard customers really testing, but also showing how this product outperforms again on sustainability, but also on the innovation side. Yeah. Your first customers can also be your salespeople. So I'm excited to see how they start advocating on behalf of Palmless and C16. And we love that because they have a whole base of loyal customers who trust mm -hmm. them and follow them. Mm -hmm. And so that's a community that we get to reach and grow with. And so we're really excited to have these first customers be our evangelist, be our marketing arm, if you will. Are there different like functionality or quality between the traditional palm oil and your palm oil? Slightly. And I think that's part of the storytelling that we do around the benefits. So an example, palm oil made from the agricultural technology does have carotenoids. It has beta carotene in it naturally. And sometimes that's stripped out, but the beta carotene gives it this reddish orange color. Our oil also has carotenoids, but in fact, they're totally novel carotenoids that come from our yeast. Our yeast makes these carotenoids or produces wow. them. We're the first people in the world to commercialize these carotenoids because they come from our yeast. And we're really just starting to understand carotenoids are antioxidants. So there's a clear benefit for skincare and what that can do for appearance of fine lines, for example, but also for edible consumption of antioxidants. Really, really exciting because we're the first people, the onus is on us to understand the impact and find the data to support that. But it's something that some of our customers are very excited about. And it's a massive performance benefit that comes from this, this new twist on natural production from microbiology. 
Right. And so since you can engineer these microbes to produce different types of molecules, have you thought about other types of molecules to produce to like, I don't know, like really hit it out of the water and just make just different types of personal care products? Yes. I think one of the, one of the tricks or one of the challenges of being in the biotech business is you have so many things you could do. We've got these tools, we've got these platforms, we've got these shiny, shiny objects that we could chase. So one of the things we have to always root ourselves in is, is this solving a problem for the groups that we're focused on for our customers? And so we have a lot of ideas. Some of them come up. We have 10% projects within the company where anyone from a first year research associate up can promote a project, a topic to spend 10% of their time on. And they've actually come up with some really interesting product ideas like this. But we also have to make sure that we're focused on solving real problems. And so we spend a lot of time with our customer base trying to understand where are current oils and fats not good enough from a performance perspective. That's in the food applications area, talking to large food manufacturers. And there are a lot of areas where current fats and oils are not good enough from a performance perspective. But in the beauty industry, in the personal care industry, which is our first market, a lot of the problems are sustainability and understanding where are the areas where people are saying that their product is clean or saying that their product is sustainable, but it's greenwashing, it's BS. And where could we make those products because they're still natural and they're highly innovative, but they also allow you to make these sustainability claims. So the answer is yes. We have to be careful not to chase shiny objects all the time because there's so much that we can do. That's a lesson that a lot of us have learned from our predecessors who have taught us so much. We solve that by really rooting ourselves in customers and trying to understand what their pain points look like. It's awesome. My question really about the in- impact and outcomes. So C16 is replacing traditional agriculture. And there's lots of people that work in agriculture, the farmers. What happens to those farmers when C16 and other companies start fermenting these products? This may be a contrarian view, but like my perspective is we need all of it. We need it all done responsibly. I'll just root this in, in some data because that's how we think. The global oils and fats market today is about $250 billion. By 2050, it's projected to be almost a trillion dollars, about 900 billion. So that's a three to four X growth in the next 30 years. And of course it's driven largely by population growth that's expected by 2050. That is a tremendous amount of growth. This podcast is called Grow Everything. The reality is we have a lot to grow and it is a growing pie. And so In a growing pie, it's important to think about how we all contribute to solving that problem, but by doing it responsibly. There is a future where agriculture exists very similarly to how it exists today, but we have to have strict bounds on how it's done responsibly. And there is a part of of that solution set where biotech and precision fermentation solve problems, but it has to be done responsibly and it has to be done sustainably. And I do think biology is at the heart of all of it. Yeast are the new trees, but trees are still trees. And how can we use our existing biology toolkit to improve the way that trees are grown, the efficiency, all of them? I think there's a bio toolkit that can solve all of it, but I really do believe that agriculture and bio-based manufacturing will and have to coexist because we have such a massive set of problems to solve and we need all of them. Yeah, I totally agree. I look at all the solutions and I go, we need those times 10. Jerome, you bring a super interesting point up and people bring it up all the time. What happens to the farmers? We need them. They're not going to go away and they might just be doing something slightly different. Slightly Um, different and let's do it better. Like a lot of farmers in palm oil today, the reality is like, They make nothing. Their wages are withheld from the plantation. They're exposed Mm. to toxic chemicals. They have to bring their children in to support production. There are so many ways that we can improve those jobs. By pushing the envelope here, we can help elevate what those jobs look like, whether they look similar to how they are today or whether they look radically different to how they are today. It's all about improving what that looks like for healthy people and healthy planet. 
I'm curious, Shar, you gave a little bit of the origin story for the company. I would say you're a very different kind of Symbio Biotech CEO. What's the Shara origin story? I would agree with that. And what makes me different is I didn't grow up in this industry. I wasn't rooted in this industry. I don't even have a PhD. And the origin story, as I laid out, is everything about this company has been rooted in the problem and solving the problem. That's a massive benefit for us. And we see it in the culture of our company and the focus of our company, that everything has been rooted in the problem and starting from first principles of how do we solve this problem? Is it even possible? We weren't even sure that this was the right toolkit. We didn't have a toolkit. We didn't have a hammer. We just wanted to solve the problem. And we found this yeast, which we really believed in, and this this solution set, and we started building that. Even though we didn't grow up in this industry, I've always loved biology. My father was an, an academic research scientist in the neuropharmacology field. And I always loved it. And I was always pretty good at it. And I thought about pursuing that as a path I just, I didn't, I ended up on wall street, which was really different from that. And by the way, wall street was an incredible place to start my career. It really taught me to work and it, it introduced such a work ethic and a structure for driving myself forward, but it was not for me. I did not care about my day job. And I joke, I had like my quarter life crisis where I sort of, everything was great about my job. The company is great. It was fun. I liked the people I worked with but I didn't care about the fundamental thing I was doing. And so I asked myself if that mattered. And it turned out for me that it did matter that if I'm going to spend the bulk of my waking hours at work, I want it to be on something that's meaningful to me. So I did a little bit of soul searching to understand what that was. And I kept coming back to biology and life sciences. And I spent most of my career applying that in the field of healthcare. So I left Goldman, I went to go work in global health and it was a big leap and it was a big pay cut. But it was really my entry into it. Now I'm working even closer to the source and commercializing biology and life sciences. So non-traditional for sure, a bit roundabout, but I think always rooted in that that love for biology and the love for science. But how did you make the leap from global health to entrepreneurship? Had you been like an entrepreneur when you were a kid? No, it's all about the problem. I talk about this a lot and I talk about entrepreneurship. I talk to people who want to be entrepreneurs And part of the message that I try to get across is there's not one path for this stuff. You know, no, I was not trying to start a mail order business when I was five or something. (laughs) Like I just, I, I had a different path, but for me, the path into entrepreneurship was seeing a problem, being outraged, trying to figure out if I could do something about it and then going to do it. And that's entrepreneurship. Like entrepreneurship is seeing a problem and doing something about it. Did I ever think I would start a company? Did I ever think I had the quote unquote risk tolerance to start a company? No. And that's okay because there's not one path. There are so many things that can make successful entrepreneurs and successful founders as long as you really care about the thing that you were doing, because it is an extreme job. So you have to really care about the thing you're doing. You're focused on what we call consumer biotech. You even use a term which we love and uh, you're based in New York City. Why did you choose to build your company here versus Boston or San Francisco? Yes. So we started in Boston because I was getting my MBA at Harvard. My co-founder was getting his PhD at Harvard and my other co-founder was an undergrad at MIT. And we met at a little place called the MIT Media Lab which is known for these wacky, wacky science commercialization concepts. So we met there and we won the Harvard President's Innovation Challenge and we got $25,000 on a big check, which is still in our office. (laughs) So we started in Boston and we, we got at one lab bench and we started doing experiments there and we kept testing and getting feedback. And again, none of us had plans to be entrepreneurs. We all had different plans for our careers, but we were drawn to the problem and kept nibbling at it. And we kept seeing if we could solve it in this way. And so we started the company there as we decided to take the leap full time into building the company. We also needed to grow. And we looked around and we looked at Boston. We looked at parts of California and we looked at New York. And the long story short is we 
took a vote. All eight people on the team at that point decided they were going to move down to New York. We packed up our lab in a U-Haul and I drove it down I-95 with our intern. And we moved to New York in the summer of 2019, I think. And we picked it because one, New York City and state we're really investing in life sciences and nobody thinks of New York as a biotech hub, but it is changing. And I know you are advocating for this change and we are all telling the story why, but part of it is that the city and state really want to invest in this industry. They, they view this as the future. They view it as a way to solve problems. They view them as great jobs. And that was attractive for us as a place to grow a company. We wanted to help grow this ecosystem And the second part of it, as you said, as a consumer biotech company, you know, that's New York. Every consumer company is based in New York. All of our customers are based here. And New York has found a really good way to lean into its unique advantage as the center of commerce and even brand and marketing to attract companies like ours that are maybe doing something that New York's not known for, like biotech, but lean into its benefits. And so for us, it just felt like a perfect home. Yeah, I always say if you're in New York, everybody comes here for one reason or another, usually about money. But if you're (laughs) going to build a brand, there's probably no better place. And if you're looking for financing, eventually you're going to end up here, which is one of the things that makes it really dynamic. If you want to meet someone, they're either here or they're going to be here at some point. And I also think there's a lot of advantage to building a company in the known hub because you have this concept of talent density and you're able to recruit people who have been at your similar peer companies and take their learnings and bring them in. First of all, we have that. We've recruited multiple people who have moved from California to New York to come join us. But I think more importantly, it's become an unfair advantage for us because there are a lot of those people who want to live in New York or need to live in New York. And we get to bring them on to our team because we're one of the fastest growing and obviously one of the best biotech companies in New York. So That's right. while it seems like it might be a disadvantage because you don't have the talent density, I actually think it's become a massive advantage for us in terms of even recruiting. And then last but not least, This type of biotech is different than pharma. Consumer biotech must be deeply cross-functional. And so being able to pull people in from all these different functions who come from outside the industry puts us a step ahead in rethinking. There's no playbook here. So we have to build the playbook from scratch. And so being able to recruit best in class from different companies and industries in New York. And do you have any sense from your point of view what the relationship is between a big city like New York or Boston or San Francisco, these biotech centers and say a place that's more rural like Kansas or Nebraska, what do you see as being that relationship as it advances into the future? So what we do here in New York is the R&D, the innovation, the lab scale work. But then we got to go scale this thing. Palm oil is tens of millions of metric tons today. You cannot manufacture that in a big city like New York or, or Boston. The rent's just too damn expensive and it doesn't make sense. And so we have to find places to scale this up. And, and our company is nothing without scale. So the two coexist and, and places in the Corn Belt are perfect partners for that. You have the people who are skilled in the scale up and transfer of large scale fermentations. You have the assets and industrial partners and companies that are experts and have the distribution arms. And so I think that they are really, really nice compliments and maybe they're odd partners, but they're critical partners at different parts of the deployment timeline. Yeah. We've heard from our friends in climate tech that if you want to do a big infrastructure project, you go to the corn belt or the rust belt. That's a much easier place to deploy these things. You're not a native biotech person. You kind of became one over time. Were there any books or movies or anything in pop culture that you read that you can recommend? I read a lot of papers. (laughs) I read a lot (laughs) of research papers. And that's how like everybody in this industry is a constant student. So Yes, I I come up to speed and I do it by reading primary sources, what's happening in, in academia and elsewhere, but so does my team. This is one of the things I love about our team. We love MOOCs, like m- massive online open courses. My team is currently, they're experts, but they're currently doing a MOOC that's run by the University of Delft. 
um, the University of Delta's best in class on fermentation. And even though my team has spent decades in fermentation, they're going through this MOOC together. Education has been so decentralized. That's been, you know, papers are kind of the opposite of that. Papers are all behind paywalls. And then MOOCs are free and open. And it's been a really fun way for us to grow and learn together. Yeah, I've done the University of Delft Industrial Biotechnology course. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's excellent. tremendous. Yeah. So are you hiring? You just talked about the talent pool and there's a lot of talent out there since all these tech companies had to let all these amazing people yeah. go. And are you guys hiring? Yeah, we're always hiring. And this is a new stage for the company. We have been primarily an R&D company to date. And we will continue, of course, always to be an R&D company and we will always be growing there. So we're always hiring scientists and engineers and manufacturing experts. But we're just entering commercialization. And so we're, we're thinking about sales and business development and marketing and comms and all of these things that are new for C16 and for our brand Pomless, for people looking to, to take their functional skills and build something fresh. We have a lot to do. So we're hiring across the board, but particularly on the commercialization side. That's fantastic. Well, listen, thank you so much, Shara, for taking the time to speak to us today. We're looking forward to having you back on as a early friend of the pod. And we wish you the best of luck. We're excited for you. We're excited for C16. And of course, we're excited for New York City because we think this is the future. Me too. Glad to be a friend of the pod and can't wait to host our next event at our space together. Awesome. Yeah, looking forward to it. Wow, that was a fantastic interview. When she talked about her company and what they do in the beginning of the episode, she didn't mention biotech once. One of the things that I've seen in the past is when people start talking about biotech, those that are not in it, like their eyes just glaze over. They're like, wait, what? They're like, oh, now we're going to something deep. But she really brings it to the people. And I really respect her for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. She speaks to this idea that at the end of the day, most people don't care where a product comes from. They just want to know the product works. I don't think anybody really cares how a product is necessarily manufactured, what feedstock, if it is even made with biotechnology, that's a bonus. It could potentially command a premium in price at the beginning, but I don't think it necessarily has to do that. I can't wait to get my hands on those products that are coming out next year. When I went to her lab, I saw some of those products. They are this beautiful orangish red color. And I think that's a color of their brand as well. But to get your hands on the product, to think of how this product was made, even though she doesn't talk about it in the commercial marketing of it. But now that people know, especially those that are listeners, but even for myself, like, wow, like this product was made from microbes rather than chopping down a palm tree. It's just a brand new world, I want to say. <laughs> you don't get that feeling when you drink a beer or eat yogurt? No, because I don't know if those are engineered organisms. I think for cheese it is. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to Most dig into cheeses. that. <laughs> Most cheeses. I yeah. love cheese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I want to know which cheeses are made through an engineer organism versus just like an evolution, like just an organic evolution. I guess <laughs> that would be a good podcast. Good yeah, I'm the rennet that gets used in in most cheeses is genetically engineered. And it has been for a while because it used to be an ingredient that was, I want to say, extracted from sheep or... Like the uh, stomach of yeah. sheep or something like that? Yeah. Something I, like that. I saw a documentary on cheese. Remember, I love cheese. So yeah. <laughs> I've heard of that. <clears throat> it helps like curdle it. Yeah, exactly. She talked about the technology is important. She's really creating a platform and there's several ways that this can go. And what I hope the audience took away is that she's just barely scratching the surface of what's possible. If you have an engineered organism and you can engineer it to use a specific feedstock, you can create so many different biomolecules. And for a company to succeed like hers, she needs to be hyper-focused. She can't go in too many directions, but other people can. Other people can build something new, build something different. So I just think that she is a good example. She's someone that everyone should be paying attention to. I keep tabs on her and just very impressed with the way that she explains what her company does. And she checks off so many boxes, the sustainability box, the social responsibility box, the distribution model, like everything. And it's just so great to unpack. 
Right. Well, and I think one of the things that I really took away from that conversation is also her problem orientation. That is their point of focus is that idea of, is this going to solve the problem? And that keeps them hyper-focused on what they're doing. So I thought that was super useful. And if you're not an entrepreneur, you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, I can't think of a better way of focusing yourself and your company. Share your thoughts. What do you think about engineering molecules for personal care, for food, the way that Shara approached it? Do you have a company that you would start theoretically or really? (laughs) It was a great podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and share our podcast far and wide. (laughs) 